How easy is it to get away with murder in the 80s? Should you hit on your boss's wife? Today, we're going to be talking about Wayne Nance, known as the Missoula Mauler, a serial killer from our own town of Missoula, Montana. Find out how not to make friends on this week's installment of Well, That's Horrible. Well, 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 that's horrible. Welcome back to this week's episode of Well, That's Horrible. I'm fairly certain that I'm Reese, and you are? Mostly uncertain that I'm Travis. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, we enjoy telling horrible stories to each other and thought you might want to listen in. But first, we need to tackle the tough questions. You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Unprofessional opinion. What's your best scar story? Ooh, I have, obviously, I have the, the scar in my head. Yeah. Uh, that's not a very good scar story, but it's my biggest scar. I, I mean, it's my, an intense scar. Yeah. I think my best scar story is the one on my back. Okay. Uh, so I was floating the river. Right. Uh, pretty early spring. Yeah. And so had all that snow melt. Yep. Uh, river's booking it, and we're like, oh, we can do it. It's mm-hmm. fine. Uh, and... We were on our way to the river, and my buddy's tube popped. Okay. Uh, so we were down one tube to right. start this whole adventure yeah. off. And we had no way to get... We didn't have cell phones. Okay. Uh, did not even own one yet. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, meaning you're old. <laughs> meaning I'm very old. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, so we're... My buddy and I, luckily, I had a big tube. Okay. So we could both fit on it pretty comfortably. You right. know, it was a little close, but, yeah. you know... Uh, you know, that's... <laughs> um, who doesn't like to snuggle with a friend on a tube? <laughs> yeah, just shirtless, uh, in the sun, On one sweating. of those butt donuts that you would yeah. use, like, if you... Have, have hemorrhoids? Hemorrhoids, yep. yeah. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> that's what we were on. <laughs> no, so we're going over these rapids. Okay. And my buddy decided that it'd be a good idea to push me off. So I go off. Right. Uh, I go under, and I get sucked under a log. Oh, no. And... I am belly on the gravel, right. and my back has a two to three inch, I'm not quite sure, uh, but a good size piece of branch Kay. off this broken tree trunk that yeah. I was stuck underneath. Yeah. Uh, so it had speared into me. <laughs> so I'm stuck there with something literally impaling me to the ah. ground. Not super long, you know. Uh, I mean, not to say that two to three inches isn't long. <laughs> That's... Plenty long, at least when it's uh, speared into my body. Right, guys. Right, I, I right. keep that's, telling my wife normal. the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's average, it's proportional. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm just belly down, and I have to rip myself out. So in the meantime, I'm ripping that piece of wood that's into my flesh Good out Lord. along. So I have this scar that sticks out. I mean, it sticks out probably a good three quarters of an inch. Wow. It's one of those like super bubbled up ones. And yeah. it looks like a pink earthworm because everything about me is pink. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I just have this like scar that's about six inches, five or six inches long. Wow. That is just, yeah. So that one was uh, probably the one I remember the most because I intense. 100% thought I was going to die. Yeah. Because yeah. I did not. It took me a while. And then I had to, we're still floating the river, right? right? This is at the beginning. Right. So then I had to walk the four and a half miles it was from uh, where this happened yeah. to the river exit. Okay. So I have this gaping wound. Right. And my friend stopped and looked at it and uh, you could see bone oh no like it was it was not good like at least they say they saw bone but right it was definitely deep and it was definitely uh very intense i yeah. had to walk the four and a half miles to the river exit and then my parent who was supposed to be there to pick me up yeah. wasn't there so 
Then we had to was borrow a cell phone. Was it the dad who'd had scotch, or was it the mom who was unhealthily into rabbits? It was the mom who was unhealthily into rabbits. <laughs> okay. Uh, she was probably out looking at her rabbits. <laughs> so then I tried to borrow a cell phone. Nobody would lend me a cell phone. Oh, I'm bleeding. No. I have this gaping wound. Yeah. And then I nobody gives me a ride. Nobody, I can't get a hold of anybody. Nobody will lend me their cell phone. Okay. And then I have to walk another mile and a half back to my house. Wow. And then go to the ER. <laughs> no way. I had to have seven interior stitches. Yeah. And then it was like twenty nine thirty. I can't remember exactly how many it was, but it was a good amount on the outside. Wow. But I had to have seven interior stitches to sew like the muscle and back over the rib cage. So. That is horrifying. <laughs> So that Good one was Lord. pretty gnarly. See, mine mine is not uh, quite so intense, but uh, when I was about, oh, 15 or 16, um, I loved to go swimming and diving mm. when I was in high school. And so the local pool was opening up, and uh, I was the first one through the doors. This was the first opening day of the season. So I immediately go out to the uh, diving board, Mm -hmm. and I haven't even gotten in the water yet. I am going (laughs) straight for the diving board. So I stand on the diving board, and you know how you run out to the end of a diving board, and then you jump up and you land on the end, and then that launches you? Mm -hmm. So uh, I stand on there, and I'm all ready to uh, show off for this super cute uh, (laughs) lifeguard. And uh, he, he was a great fella. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I go running out to the end of the diving board, jump up, and then go to land on the end. And I had jumped too far, and just my heels oh. catch on the end of the diving board. So they slip off the end, and I hit my back on the edge of the diving board. And I was really glad that I was underwater because I screamed like a (laughs) tiny little girl. (laughs) And, uh, oh, it hurts so bad. The chlorine in in those. So uh, turns out that I had scraped off the skin on my lower three vertebrae. So my bones were actually showing. Oh, God. I had scraped it so bad. So I climb out. And obviously the super cute lifeguard, she comes over to check on me and I'm like, yeah, this probably isn't so great. So she takes me to the first aid station and uh, (laughs) this was, again, opening day and their entire first aid station consisted of one Band-Aid and one rubber glove. So I was... I don't know that I've ever been as conflicted as I was right then because I was in a ton of pain. I was also surrounded by like five very attractive (laughs) girls in swimsuits and they were fawning over me and so worried about me. I assumed at the time that it was because I was ruggedly handsome. No, they were just doing their jobs, but we're going to go with the ruggedly handsome option. (laughs) And uh, so... They they had their Band-Aid, and they put the one Band-Aid over one of the holes leading to my spine. And so I said, oh, thank you. And being super tough, I thought, you know what? I need to show off again. So my inevitable conclusion was I need to get back in the water. Ugh. So I went back, and I jumped off the diving board again, and it was the same lifeguard. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm just going back and swimming. You can't get in the pool with open (laughs) wounds bleeding all over the place. So I had to leave. But on the upside, I had a whole bunch of cute girls paying attention to me. So So worth it. Silver linings. Worth it. Chicks dig scars. (laughs) Uh, You know what? Uh, I think we've had enough of this frivolity. Let's uh, (laughs) let's tell some horrible shit. (laughs) All aboard! So like I said, today's story is actually local to us here in Missoula, Montana. Uh, This (laughs) this all happened just a matter of miles from where we're recording right now, actually. I want to give a trigger warning for people. Uh, This man, 
I don't know how to say this. This man was a ginger. <laughs> um, his parents should have known the monster he would turn into just from that fact. For those of you that don't know, Travis is also a soulless ginger. <laughs> when I'm a day I, walker. What's that? <laughs> I'm a day walker, so <laughs> I shave it off so nobody knows. <laughs> they can just stare at my disgusting so you can star. Try to blend into society <laughs> right. like you're a real person. <laughs> right. <laughs> when I inevitably get murdered in my basement, you guys, just know that it is Travis giving into his gingery nature. Mm-hmm. I need those souls. <laughs> Wayne Nance is born in October of 1955 in Missoula, Montana. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, He is referred to in the media by the name the Missoula Mauler. Um, This isn't from birth, just to clarify. (laughs) Uh, That would have been a little weird. Did you know that I I just realized this? We had the Maulers team. Like... What? There used to be the Missoula Maulers goddamn hockey team. There was a hockey team named yeah. after this guy? I don't know if they're named after that guy, well, but I, I just realized so. That... If they're called the Missoula Maulers, yeah. we need to dig into this. I, I, that's shocking to me. It was an amazing game when they played the Jeffrey Dahmers. It was <laughs> <Right>. great. <laughs> Who names their God. team after a serial killer? I don't know if it was named after the oh, serial spoiler killer. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but, wow yeah. fucking Maulers yeah I just realized that <laughs> I had not seen the connection I went to their games interesting and I never realized that like well maybe we'll have cool. to find out and see if uh, good old Wayne here played hockey <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just like most people that I talk about I'm going to be referring to him in this story by his last name Gives me so much joy to get to call this monster Nance for the rest of this. (laughs) (laughs) I feel feel like good old Nance and Rand are just pleasant white folks who live in the suburbs. Nance is a teacher who's close to retirement. Rand is just retired from the local accounting firm. Their son, Braxton Hicks, has (laughs) been a bit of a disappointment. He just fell in with the wrong crowd in high school. I mean, you know how it goes, and it, it just derailed his plans. He'd wanted to go into medical school, but multiple MIPs tend to have an impact on that. So there you have it. That's the backstory. I also feel slightly called out. (laughs) (laughs) Nance and his family lived in a mobile home outside of town. His mother is a waitress and his father is a truck driver. Despite being a latchkey kid, he seems to have excelled at school. He's known to have a hot temper and is a bit of a troublemaker. Even with the behavior issues, though, he manages to graduate high school with mostly A's and B's. The general consensus is that Nance is odd, but generally likable. Hmm. I'm feeling kind of called out here as well. Uh, I I think that's kind of how my parents describe me to everyone. I, I get that he's weird. I get that he's weird. But he has no friends. Just hang out with him. He's a decent person once you get to know him. <laughs> For quite a while as a child, Nance is well liked in the trailer park. However, as he gets older, he begins to show some concerning behaviors. Local kids begin telling his parents that he would be intentionally cruel to other children and seem to get joy out of it. In his early teens, he walks through a local junkyard that has a garbage incinerator. Nance finds a box of kittens near the incinerator. Like any kid, he's (laughs) surprised and ecstatic to find all these adorable felines. The owner of the trailer park watches Nance as he picks up the box, throws it into the incinerator, and turns it on. Laughing the whole time. The trailer park owner is tempted to go to Nance's parents and tell them, but he is too afraid of Nance. (laughs) This 15-year-old kid? No, I get that. No, he was even younger than that. Oh, really? He was like 12 when this happened. Yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah. So this little ginger slap in nature's face even became (laughs) so disruptive on the school bus that he is prevented from riding anymore on the bus. He also liked to jump out and scare people and would talk about creepy and sexual topics just to make people around him uncomfortable. Honestly, I feel like that just kind of describes our podcast. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) kind (laughs) of. About this time, Nance develops an obsession with the occult. 
he starts to wear a fake shrunken head on a necklace. He desperately wants to become an ordained warlock and is convinced through a dream that the only way to do so is to sacrifice someone before his 19th birthday. He even lies to his friends and tells them that his birthday is on Halloween. One day, Nance comes across a used hypodermic needle near the playground and tells his friends that he's going to stab someone with it. His friends call shenanigans on his threats, so he stands up, walks over to the other boy, and stabs him in the leg with the needle. Ugh. All he gets is some detention for this. <laughs> that boy became a man. A man <laughs> named Nick Nolte. You think you can hurt me with your little prick, you bastard? That's not even the first time I've shot up today. <laughs> you ever smoke meth through your eyeball? There's no high like it. <laughs> Later in his teens, Nance's dad gets arrested for assault and robbery when he tries to hold up a grocery store at gunpoint. He is convicted and sentenced to five years in prison. Hmm. When Nance is 18 and still living at home, Nance thinks it would be the perfect time to start killing. Nobody's really sure about what kicks off his murders. It's possible that it is just related to his fascination with the occult, but no one is sure. He lives just up the street from the Pounds family. Nance breaks into their home while Harvey Pounds, a deacon at the local Bethel Baptist Church, is at work. He knew where the Pounds kept their handguns since he had been over to their house numerous times. A lot of the articles on this guy seem to imply that simply being in someone's house gives you instant knowledge of where they keep their guns. <laughs> right. I mean, okay, this is this is Montana, so you can pretty much find a gun behind any door, under the couch cushions, in the toy box, Happy Meals, things like that. <laughs> and uh, I don't mean to brag, but I've been in a lot of people's houses, and sometimes they've even invited me. Uh, <laughs> but unless I was specifically there to talk about guns. I don't think I've ever been shown where someone keeps their guns. Maybe it's just the part of the country we live in, but I feel like people in this part of the country tend to be a little uh, clandestine about where they hide their guns. So anyway, Nance takes the gun into... So anyway, Nance takes the gun into Pound's bedroom, ties Donna up with some clothesline he had brought with him, and rapes her at gunpoint. He then takes her to the basement and fires five bullets into her head. You know, because he's a filthy ginger. There is a neighbor that reports that they'd seen Nance near the house, but this isn't enough info to go off of. He originally claims that he had been at school the day that Pound's is killed, but it comes to light that he had actually been home. Still, however, there is not enough evidence to charge him with anything. Nance claims that he'd been sick that day and in bed, and apparently this is a sturdy enough alibi for the cops. They get a search warrant for Nance's home, however, and did find bloody underwear, but they had been washed, which apparently meant that no DNA can be taken from them. It's just <sighs> something that... In all of these serial killers, yeah. there's every time there's just incompetent policing. Like, are them. you fucking serious? <laughs> like, it's just every time, like Dahmer, like he had that guy that ran out with his bloody ass yeah. like into the road. And, yep. and they're like, oh, it's fine. It's just every time. That's how gay couples are. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, it's every time there's like cops are like, Oh, well, maybe. Yeah. And then we don't have enough. Right. But then... <laughs> Should we but put the, some effort into this murder? Nah. Right. <laughs> no, we got tickets to give out. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> this guy's window tint is a little too dark. Right. <laughs> That's what we need to focus on. <sighs> the good old days of murder. So much easier to get away with stuff. Well, boys, we saw this guy hold a knife to this man's throat and slice him from ear to ear. We have multiple officers who witnessed this happen as well. <laughs> but the perp kind of wiped the handle of the knife a little bit with a Kleenex, so there's no way to pin it on him. Nothing. Nothing to go on. <laughs> Several days later, Nance is sitting next to his friend Bill at school and suddenly says, It is done. 
before lifting his shirt sleeve and showing Bill a swollen, infected pentagram carved into his forearm. Dope. That's cool. Like, fucking if, if you ever want me to carve a pentagram <laughs> into your forearm, I've got a nice butter knife over here. Yeah, I mean, I did carve hate life into my knuckles as a teen. Of course So, like, you did. I can't, like... <laughs> rip on this too much but <laughs> did <laughs> you have douche. your mohawk at this time i did yeah okay. yeah my, so those went hand in hand oh yeah i used to i also roll these like gaudy rings that i'd use and i'd fight people with them like of course yeah, you would fucking <laughs> douchebag <laughs> because of how much nance had been talking about sacrificing someone to become an ordained warlock bill comes to the conclusion that nance is responsible for the death of pounds Bill goes and tells the principal of their school about his epiphany. The principal decides that he's just going to ignore it because he didn't (laughs) want to ruin Nance's life with accusations. Literally, he didn't investigate it, didn't look into it, just decided that he didn't want to ruin Nance's life by looking into it or investigating this suspicion. Oh, no, he's a... Good boy, you know. And this was a friend that came forward. He just raped a girl behind a dumpster, that's fine. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. If... This was a friend that came forward with this. I feel like that carries more weight. If a right. an actual friend comes, it's it's another thing if some random kid shows up and is just trying to trash someone. But this was a friend that came forward. That took a lot of guts. And then right. the principal just blows him off. Fucking. <laughs> Every time. Every time. <laughs> it's the, not that serial killers are really smart. It's that most people are really, really dumb. Really dumb. <laughs> including me. Yeah. The cops ask including Nance. Including you. <laughs> <laughs> the cops ask Nance to come in for a polygraph test, and he agrees. Naturally, his next act is to research the shit out of polygraph tests and how to fool them. He goes in and, wonder of wonders, passes with flying colors. Hmm. Because there weren't any other credible suspects, Harvey Pounds becomes the prime suspect. His case isn't helped at all when it comes to light that he'd been having an affair. But since there's so little evidence, this murder soon turns into a cold case. At 18, Nance up and joins the Navy. By and large, he's actually great in the military. He is well-liked, does his job well, and is moving up in the ranks. In 1974, he is subpoenaed by a grand jury to return to Missoula for an inquest on the murder of Pounds. Through the entire thing, he remains cool as a cucumber. They even presented him with evidence that his alibi is completely false, and it didn't seem to shake him at all. Hmm. In the end, the grand jury didn't indict a single person. While he seems cool and collected during the legal proceedings, when he returns to his post on base, his strange side starts to come out. His spotless military record is tarnished when he is caught with weed, LSD, two butterfly knives, and stolen binoculars. (laughs) That just sounds like a good time. I can't tell you the number of times I've been trying to have just a chill night, taking acid, dual-wielding butterfly knives, looking through the windows with binoculars, and some wet blanket of a human being tells me (laughs) I have to leave the Target parking lot. Nance is slapped with numerous fines, two rank reductions, and then is discharged for misconduct. About five years later, the body of a raped and stabbed teenage girl is found near Beavertail Hill State Park. Mm, uh, I fish this there is all actually, the time. What's that? I fish there all the time. <laughs> I do. You can get the stock it with bass. They I didn't do. know that that's where they found a body. That's creepy. And this is one of my favorite places to not catch fish. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that don't know, I have fished for five years and not caught a single fish. Not once. It's So Travis actually even took uh, pity on me and took me fishing one time. And how long did I curse you for? Like four hours. <laughs> no, like how long oh. did it take for you to uh, oh, be oh. able to catch fish again? It took a little bit. It took like three times, but then I went to that exact spot I took yep. you, like, and caught like five fish. So, like, <laughs> my my family is done for if we are relying on my fishing abilities to survive. <laughs> so anyway, this girl doesn't match any missing persons reports, and so she is dubbed Betty Beavertail. Until 1985. Oh, they did her dirty. They really did. When I first saw the name that they'd settled her with, I figured, oh, there's no chance that back in 85, Beaver meant a woman's vagina. 
Otherwise, that would be such a cruel joke to play on someone. But no, no, that word, I looked into it, uh, became slang back in 1929. Mm. So they were for sure very intentional on that nickname. That was just, that's horrible. In 1984, this filthy ginger gets a job working as a bouncer at the cabin bar in Missoula. His mom also works there as a bartender. She and her husband get into an argument about her drinking. His mom leaves in a huff, jumps in her car, speeds off, tries accelerating around a curve, slams into a tree, and dies immediately on impact. Interestingly enough, her death is ruled a suicide by local cops. I don't know how that makes any sense. I don't know either. (laughs) Nance begins to get a reputation with the staff at the bar. Anytime a pretty girl comes in, he immediately approaches them and tries for a date. When he inevitably gets turned down, he sulks off into a corner and stares at the poor girl for the rest of the night. It is around this time that it's also discovered that Nance has quite the collection of hand-drawn blueprints of local women's houses. Jesus. (laughs) He is also dating a 16-year-old girl named Marcella Bachman. Keep in mind that he's 29 at this point. Oh, that's gross. 29. Gross. He's double her age. Uh, Not creepy at all. They tell everyone that they're going to be leaving town soon and starting a new life together. Only three months later, a wildlife photographer finds a human foot poking out of the ground. Marcella's body is found in the woods near town. The medical examiner is able to determine that she's been shot three times in the head, I'm guessing because of the three holes in her head, and that she'd been dead for about three months. Since she also didn't match any reports, they call her Debbie Deer Creek. People back in the 80s really loved their alliteration. Yeah. A few months later, in 1985, another body pops up. This one they call Christy Crystal Creek. I think if they'd spent as much time investigating these murders instead of coming up with corny names, this case would have been wrapped up way quicker. Right. <laughs> they all match the same M.O. They do. Like, same M.O. all the way through. You're like, oh, what about that guy we thought murdered that lady by yep. shooting her in the head after he raped her? Like, all these ladies that have been shot in the head and raped, like... Could, could it can... be the same person? No. Nope. Suicide. Don't even look into it. <laughs> The victim had been shot two times in the head and then dumped. When the medical examiner looks her over, he is able to determine that she is probably Asian because of some regionally specific dental work. She is probably left-handed and took care of her teeth. That's all they could tell about her. (laughs) That's weird. It really is. A couple, Dory and Bill Schmidt, move into Missoula close to Nance's home. Bill is staying with his mom because he and Dory were arguing about his drinking. Seems to be a trend for this episode. Anyway, Dory is initially the only one living there, so Nance believes that she is single. A few days after she moves in, Nan- A few days after she moves in, Nance decides that he's going to go for it. He busts in and makes his way to their bedroom, only to be met by Bill, who had come home just that day. Bill invites Nance to join them in bed. He begins by gently caressing the side of Nance's face. Then he moves his hand lovingly up the side. I'm kidding. <laughs> but <Jesus>. it's, n- <laughs> it's not honestly much weirder than what actually happened. Nance acts confused and said that he is just lost and thought it was someone else's house. And Bill buys it. <laughs> Seriously, he accepts that explanation for why there is a strange man in his bedroom in the middle of the night. Nance walks out of the room, and Bill goes back to sleep. For some strange reason, Dory just can't let it go. Typical woman, right? (laughs) So she forces Bill to go downstairs, where he finds Nance sitting on the couch. Bill grabs him by the neck and flings him outside, but still doesn't call the cops. The next morning, Nance is still on their front lawn, sleeping. I want to really rake Bill over the coals... Honestly, I, I, I seriously do, but going back to sleep after a strange man walks into your bedroom, it seems insane. It really does. <laughs> but I can 100% see my wife Erica having to essentially kick me out of bed to go check on something because I love sleep <laughs> so much. I'm sure right. the guy left. It's fine. It's, it's fine. fine. It's good. 
By the end of that year, Nance gets back into the business of home invasions. Mike and Teresa Shook are just sitting down to dinner with their three kids when Nance pounds on the door. Mike answers the door, and Nance stabs him to death with a butcher knife. Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. He then drags Teresa to the bedroom where he rapes her and stabs her to death. Not content with all this horror, he sets the house on fire to kill the kids. He left the kids in there and set the house on fire. The authorities fortunately find the kids alive, but Nance is long gone and they couldn't find any evidence to tie him to the murders. God, what a piece of shit. No kidding. Uh, And I also saw the poor kids actually witnessed this and were so traumatized that they couldn't give any details about what the guy looked like. Yeah, I bet. I mean, imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'd be traumatized now. Right. And I'm old. Nance gets a job at Conlon's Furniture as a delivery truck driver. They are not sponsoring this because I don't think they want to be associated (laughs) with the the story. That's the ringtone. That's the jingle. For Conlon's? turn houses into homes. Yeah, you haven't heard that? Nope, never heard it. Fuck. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Goddamn transplants. (laughs) He becomes enamored with Chris Wells, who is the wife of his manager, Doug Wells. Nance drops right back into his creepy ways. He gets Chris a necklace, which he later finds in the trash. Chris clearly had decent taste in men. Right. (laughs) She knew. Yeah, yeah, she knew it was terrible. Next, he leaves a ceramic turtle for her with the note, quote, Since you didn't appreciate the jewelry I gave you, I thought maybe you would like a nice piece of artwork. I may be slow and cold-blooded, but only time will tell. How creepy is that? That is very creepy. And yet, when I leave you that note, you love it. (laughs) In 1986, Doug sees someone sneaking around his house and goes outside to take a look. He finds Nance, and Nance claims that he'd been driving by and stopped when he saw someone peering in the house. That excuse has to just work out so well. Oh, uh, why am I in this open bank safe with a ski mask on and toting a hand grenade? (laughs) Oh, am am I a robber? Oh, heavens no, no, no. I was just on my way to the ski resort uh, slash grenade range when I saw your fine establishment being robbed, so I ran in to help. When Doug goes to turn on his flashlight, Nance pistol whips him, which kind of puts a damper on his Good Samaritan act. Right. Nance then goes inside to get Chris and orders her at gunpoint to tie Doug up. He ties Chris up and orders Doug into the basement. Nance stabs Doug in the chest with an 8-inch butcher knife. He understandably assumes Doug is dead and goes back upstairs to the bedroom where he had left Chris. What Nance didn't know is that he had missed Doug's heart by about one inch, and Doug is a real-life John (laughs) McClane. Doug gets out of the ropes that were restraining him and manages to get his rifle. He makes his way upstairs, confronts Nance, and then shoots him in the side. Uh, I'll post a picture of him and Chris, but Doug looks like every friendly neighborhood accountant you've ever met. (laughs) But because he knew what Nance is going to do to Chris, Doug finds the strength to bash Nance's skull in with the gun. Fuck. Holy shit, that had to feel good. Oh, man. Right? (laughs) Like, uh, that's what he fucking deserves. Yep. Maybe even worse. God. Uh, Yep. And uh, now there is an alternate report that states that Nance accidentally shot himself in the face. Uh, (laughs) Honestly, I hope that Doug got to bash the fuck out of this piece of shit and just wipe him off the planet himself. Mm -hmm. After Nance is smushed to death, the cops discover finally that this hadn't been an isolated incident. Oh, really? Yeah, you think? Nance is eventually linked to six different murders. It took several decades of DNA technology to catch up with the evidence. Thanks to DNA testing... Thank God for DNA testing. (laughs) God damn... Thanks to DNA testing, they were able to identify Marcy Bachman, a.k.a. Debbie Deer Creek, in 2006, Devonna Nelson, a.k.a. Betty Beavertail, in 2009, God, and finally... they did Devonna so fucking dirty. What's that? They did Devonna so fucking dirty. They really did. And uh, finally, as of 2021, Christy Crystal Creek had been identified as Janet Lucas. Hmm. I was trying to figure out... 
a point that this would make more sense in the story, but I couldn't find a spot. Uh, so anyway, the police did facial reconstruction on two of Nance's victims and posted the picture in the newspaper to try to find out who they were. I'm guessing that they asked the local second graders to tackle this project because <laughs> these facial reconstructions don't even look human, much less like someone you'd recognize. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to post a picture of this on our socials, but it is really bad. <laughs> they look like what I imagine sits on your chest when you're having sleep paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> I was so baffled by these terrible nicknames that the cops shackled these poor girls with that I wanted to do some research on other terrible nicknames. So I stumbled across a list of the 25 worst pet names for your lover. <laughs> First off, I really hate that the article called them your lover instead of like significant other. That just seems way better than lover. Right. Um, so anyway, here's the definitive list of terrible nicknames to call your lover. Schmoop or Schmoopy. Schmoopy. Poopsie. Cutie Patootie. Most anything food related, not <laughs> limited to pudding, baby cakes, honey pot, muffin, baby... Oh, nope, that was the end of the food. <laughs> baby girl and baby boy are not foods. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they shouldn't depends be. on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> baby girl or baby boy, snuggleophagus, juju bee, cow pie. Oh, cow pie? Mm -hmm. That's just an insult. Muammar Gaddafi, <laughs> booger, love, lovey yummers, lovely yummers, thunder chunk, tubba wubba, Hitler, <laughs> fart bomber, paycheck, princess, hey you. Mein Führer, <laughs> Representative Wiener, Bedbug, Penis the Menace, Mama or Daddy, and yeah. Vegetarian. <laughs> vegetarian? <laughs> no, Vegetarian. Oh. No. <laughs> what is one of the worst nicknames you've ever had? I mean, uh, m my nickname as like a little baby, mm -hmm. like my brothers gave me, was Drooler. <laughs> and that stuck with me until I was like 12. I mean, then, we still call you that. Right. <laughs> so Drooler was definitely one of them. Uh, I mean, otherwise, I mean, I've only had, like, a lot of people used to call me Red. Okay. Because, um, duh. Yeah. And then TiVo, like, that was not very good. Cause, right. Because, you know, that used to be a device people recorded TV Just shows a with. box. Yeah. So, like, TiVo. Like, yep. That one's all right. But. <laughs> See, I had, I had a couple. Um, the one that I hated when I was a kid was Reese's Pieces. Mm. Hated it with a passion. So I just decided to own it. So every time I meet someone now, I just say it's Reese like the peanut butter cups. And uh, <laughs> I just roll with it. But the odd one that I had that there was no logical explanation for it um, was my parents forgot the difference. Uh, you know the uh, you know the little rascals? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is alfalfa mm -hmm. and... Uh, buckwheat. Mm. So my parents confused alfalfa and buckwheat, and I have <laughs> aggressive calyx. When I wake up in the morning, I look like I am a male peacock just trying to attract a mate. It I is, thought that was the vibe you were going for. It is the vibe I'm going for, <laughs> just peacocking it. Uh, and so my parents called me buckwheat because they confused the two, but then it split. And... <laughs> My dad would call me Buck Swede, and then he separated Buck and Swede, so he would call me Buck or Bucky or Swede. I'm not Swedish, <laughs> but he would still call me Swede. <laughs> That's probably nice. the worst nickname I dealt with. <laughs> my um, dad used to call uh, one of my foster brothers Stain, <laughs> and he'd tell him, <laughs> in a loving way, uh, the best part of you rolled down your mama's ass crack and became a stain on the mattress. So that's exactly what you want to t tell a eight year old, an eight yeah, year old when, foster kid. Foster kid, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's not like he grew up to become a criminal or anything. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to the best of us. <laughs> uh, Travis, I think we need some good news. Oh, I'm so ready for some good news. Good news, everyone. <laughs> 
Well, that's not so horrible. So, there was, uh, recently, during the Ukraine conflict, yeah. there's the largest uh, relocation of lions during a war conflict. So that's a new record uh, that the world has. So in, Are they relocating them from the Ukraine? Yeah, so they moved uh, 11 lions from southern Ukraine, from Odessa, Ukraine, because they're obviously at war. Right. So they're like, these lions are in a high-risk area. We have to get them out of here. So they ship them to Romania okay. uh, in May of this year. Right. And then just in September, at the end of September of this year, they took nine of them, nine lions and two cubs to Colorado. Okay. And then two other ones went to, goddamn, South Africa. That's annual sanctuary in South Africa. But they got carted on out. They're safe. The lions aren't going to die. You know, the people are still fucked. Yeah. But the lions <laughs> the are lions out of there. Are fine. We, we can feel better. Were you the know. lions in a, uh, in a zoo? Oh, yeah. They're in a, they were in a Biopark Zoo in Odessa, Ukraine. Huh. So that's... I, well, I did at like. least the, the lions are safe. That's all that really matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, they moved them to Targamirez, Romania. Uh, that's fantastic. So, yeah. So Romanian tigers. Romanian Ooh. tigers. Ukrainian tigers <laughs> yeah. that became Romanian tigers that became... Transpl- American tigers. Transplant tigers. Tig- transplant tigers. <laughs> They're actually lions. Oh, um, yeah, they are lions. I had tigers on the brain from the Ron and Joy holiday right? episode. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> lions. Uh, not tigers. Nope. Yeah, they were like, fuck e- tigers. Equally killing. <laughs> yeah. I think a tiger would definitely kick a lion's ass, though. You think so? Dude, yeah. Like, tigers are scary. They like, are. They can jump so high and they can. So can lions, though. Yeah, I mean, lions can jump higher than your uh, average house. You already made that joke. I'm not biting on this one. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) Uh, I'd like to do a shout out to some listeners who left great reviews for us. So thank you to EDB82412, Michaela B, Mark Friedman 3, KT Reberg, Do B Doe. And Elephantitis. 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 I love Elephantitis. <laughs> Do we know? Yep. Your, uh, your reviews mean just so much to us. So much. Well, that wraps up this week's episode of Well, That's Horrible. Please like, rate, and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you listen to. Hell, do it on all platforms. Why are you clapping? I don't know. It felt like a clappable moment. So I was just going for it. I, I felt it in my heart. I... Gotcha. I'll fuck that. It really threw me. My bad. Not a clappable moment. Thank you all who have stuck with us on this journey. We really appreciate you all. Remember not to keep drawings of your neighbor's floor plans, but if you do... You need to hide them better. And always remember to make the world a little less horrible. Well, 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 that's horrible.